Hey, I'm Elia Einhorn, podcast producer at The Talk House. Today, we have a couple of very special guests, starting with Alan Palomo, is Neon Indian, and Neon Indian is a modern master of retro synthesizers. Last year's hugely popular record, Vega International Night School, brought Palomo's gorgeous falsetto, gurgling synths, and breezy dance floor rhythms, as well as trippy visuals to accompany each song, and an amazing music video slash short film called Slumlord Rising. Alan, are you blushing yet? Uh, my ears are burning, that's for sure. <laughs> it also brought Alan together with synth-punk pioneer Martin Reb of Suicide, who remixed the song Annie, and the two recorded a fantastic TalkHouse music podcast that you can check out on our website. Alan, welcome to the TalkHouse, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Carolyn Polichek fronts the wonderful group Chairlift, and she's recorded solo as well under the name Ramona Lisa. She's collaborated with, amongst many others, Blood Orange, Subtract, and Holy Ghost, and co-wrote and produced Beyonce's song, No Angel. Chairless new album, Moth, uh oh, she's making a face. Chairless new album, Moth, is fantastic. And I got to catch the band live when the talk house went down to South by Southwest earlier this year. They put on an incredible live show. Carolyn, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Alan Palomo and Carolyn Polachek in conversation for the Talk House Music Podcast. How are you, Alan? I'm doing pretty good. I, I feel like with that kind of setup, I thought we were going to start like figure skating or something. It's, it's I wouldn't like, mind. I used to figure skate when I was young. Oh, no way. I wasn't very good at it. I did uh, gymnastics for a little bit, but I think it was mostly because uh, my brother was like super what? into it. Like He was almost an Olympian. Uh, and uh, my parents were kind of just like, well, we might as well drop them up, you know, both off at the same place. <laughs> so I was just kind of just doing cartwheels in the background. Um, but I can brother? Uh, older brother. Older brother. Yeah. He's actually, he's the one in the, in the band uh, playing bass. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I think it's easy to sort of look up to what an older brother does or an older brother's good at. Yeah. Well, your sister was performing uh, with you on the Ramona Lisa shows, right? That's right. My sister's actually an incredible vocalist. I think, you know, in terms of uh, the instrument we were born with, she definitely has the superior voice. Um, Wild. Yeah. It's, it's funny because I, I feel that way about my brother in the sense that, like, he is such a committed musician, you know, to his craft. Like, I can play my songs if I learn my songs, you know. Yes. But he can just pick up anything and just start shredding. And, you know, as, as things went on with the live show and, you know, I realized like, oh, we're going to need a percussionist to play this stuff. He's like, oh, I studied Latin percussion in Berkeley. Or like so every day I find out he knows how to play some like crazy instrument. It's you know? amazing. Yeah, it's, it's so, it was so fun um, touring with her and working with her. I mean, mostly because the, the project involves so much dance. And it's amazing having someone with pretty much the identical body to you. So you, so much can go without saying. You know, you both raise your arm in the same way. You both step with the same sort of posture. So uh, it sort of made it a little trickier for the third girl who was like, hey, I'm not related to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I'm seeing like one of those like uh, mirror like mime exercises where you try to like copy the exact yeah. motions of the other person. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, what was it like touring with your sister? Uh, it was great. Um, it felt like a, a sort of like cool family vacation minus parents. And she lives here in New York? Yeah. How about your brother? He lives in San Antonio, um, which was, you know, I mean, that's kind of been the coolest part of uh, having him in the band is that, you know, he, uh, because he lived in Texas and, you know, I only visit every so often, like, this is the most we've hung out. Um, you know, since I would say since we lived together, you know, wow. and you know, I mean, we shared a room pretty much up until, you know, I went to college. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like, we only, you know, we only ever fight about the stupid stuff, you know, it's like about yeah. a movie or something. Um, but I feel like it's always, uh, yeah, it's a, it, it, his, his enthusiasm also is really infectious. When did you move to New York? Uh, I moved to New York January of, uh, 2000. 10 so i guess yeah a little little over six years but your first record was made in texas yeah 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 that was kind of made in a i mean i was in austin and um you know it was like a really uh it was actually you know a very strange transitional period between denton which i'd been living in for the past three years and then eventually what would be new york just because like I wasn't real, you know. I wasn't paying attention in college. Was definitely ill-equipped for academia. You know, just going into it was like mm -hmm. not in the frame of mind to be going to classes and stuff. So I let my grades slide, and then you know, and then ultimately was getting more and more obsessed with this project that I had called Vega. But you know, pr the production angle of it was like just so exhausting to like. You know, I mean, dance music's any way you cut it is you know not easy to make in terms of uh, 
you know, if you don't have the adequate resources and, and know how it's going to work in a club context and all that. So Neon Indian was just kind of this, I want to, I, I keep wanting to curse casually and I understand that, uh, we can't exactly do that. Um, but, uh, I wish we just had a button you could hit every time you felt the need for an expletive. <laughs> <laughs> just like a, yeah, like a, like a slide whistle sound or something. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, ultimately that just kind of was birthed out of, you know, a need to just have a project where I just you know the, the the proposition was you write a song every day and then in less than a month I had a record and that's never happened since wow well I think when you're just starting out sort of just the act of finishing something is good enough in itself or the longer you go you, the, the pickier you become and the, the loftier the, the goals are how did you meet uh, Patrick and start working with him I met Patrick in a really Patrick's my bandmate in chairlift for anyone who's unfamiliar with chairlift um I met Patrick on my first day of freshman orientation in college. Oh, at, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, he was actually my first friend. Um, not ever, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, but not, not 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 far off actually. Um, no, I met Patrick uh, because his his band at the time was opening for Cat Power, and it was my wow. first day of freshman orientation. I didn't know anyone, and so I looked up, you know, I looked in the college newspaper and saw what's going on tonight, and I went to Cat Power's show in an amphitheater by myself. And his band opened, and it was mostly a, a, like a jazz outfit. And what were they called? I'm not going to tell you because the name was so bad. Patty. I was waiting for it. I thought, yeah, no, I was really hoping nope. it was going to be like, uh, nope. yeah, that's like a that's a trade Patty secret. and his Whalers, or like some kind of like ska band no, type it was name. Worse than that. Worse. <laughs> um, but it did not have the word Patty in it. I'll tell you that. But um, I uh, asked them after their set if they were at all looking for a keyboardist or a backing vocalist because I loved what they were doing and I just moved there and I was 18 and didn't know anyone and would love to play with them and they uh, they took my number and the next day I got a call from Patrick and he said hey this is Patrick uh, I met you last night and uh, uh, we're not looking a great for impersonation someone of in the too. band my friend just wanted your number I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was very disappointed but um, I hung out with Patrick later that day and listened to Weather Report and two hours later after jamming with him in his living room I was in the band so amazing so we've been we've been playing together since that band fell apart and then I started chairlift with someone else and then Patrick joined in a sort of inverse way of essentially asking if he could join and me saying no we didn't need a drummer and then of course he comes to on rehearsal and we have a drummer so now chairlift is just the two of us and has been since uh, 2010 yeah, since the uh, second record, right? Yeah, exactly. Since the beginning of the second record. Um, and that uh, that happened in New York, Chairlift? Uh, actually, formed in Colorado. Um, wow. Yeah, we were a Colorado-based band for about like six months, and then I got accepted to art school at NYU, and, and we relocated. And how do you feel... Uh, you know, uh, have you been in Greenpoint the whole time, or no? I've moved around. When I first moved here, I was in Williamsburg uh, in, I guess, 2006. I was moved to Williamsburg for two years while I was in school, and then um, moved. Actually, moved in with the artist that I was working for. I was assisting an artist for three years, doing like fabrication and stretching. 20 foot long canvases it was actually really hard work but um she got a grant while i was working for her and got to move to chelsea with a, in a doorman building for the rest of her life and so there was suddenly a bedroom in her studio that i could i could sublet so i was living with her while chairlift was doing the beginning of touring which was kind of an ideal situation because i had a, both a job and an apartment that i that i could sort of turn on and off at will whenever i wasn't touring and she was very understanding i think for a musician in New York, that's a near impossible that situation to come across. For sure. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for that. But uh, but eventually I moved to Chelsea, and I lived in Chelsea in a kind of shitty apartment. Th- oh, sorry. In a... <laughs> <laughs> not, <laughs> boo! Yeah. In a, <laughs> well, these, well, these guys will edit it. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. I, I lived in a not extremely beautiful apartment in Chelsea for a few years. But what I really liked about living in Manhattan was how anonymous you feel. Which, you know, Brooklyn, especially North Brooklyn, is there has so many musicians living there that I feel like it's sort For of sure. like high school. Like you're walking into the cafeteria uh, when, you leave the, when you leave the apartment. The cafeteria being Five Leaves. Or the uh, cafeteria <laughs> being Manhattan <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> totally, totally. Or even the L train. And, you know, sometimes it's great because things, all sorts of things end up happening that you wouldn't expect. Like you're walking down the street and suddenly you find yourself in a session. Yeah. But, um, and that's sort of like the dream. That's why people move to New York. But then, you know. It's kind of losing that quality a little bit. Um, or at yeah. the very least, I know that a lot of, uh, at least our music friends have relocated to Los Angeles um, yeah that's true I don't know I try not to be too pessimistic about it there's so many new musicians coming up and the scene is evolving and 
and changing. And, and I guess it's like, you know, I mean, I, I kind of go back and forth always between, because I, I mean, I arrived in 2010 and outside of, you know, like crashing on some couches for the first like six months, I've just been on the same block in Greenpoint. Um, and it's definitely evolved, you know, like Williamsburg kind of moves up a block uh, every yep. six months. <laughs> um, and the foot traffic gets a little bit more intense. And obviously, you know, I can't, I, I have friends that, or yeah, all, all our friends are always kind of complaining about gentrification, but to some extent, like, you know, I'm a musician, I live in Brooklyn, I sell a lifestyle, you know, I'm like totally part of the problem when it comes to like being a transplant and having arrived. And ultimately what we don't realize is that we, you know, we've been doing like research and development for these condominium companies. Um, but at the, you know, uh, at the end of the day, New York will never stop being like the epicenter of the Western world. You know, it's always going to be this like soup of culture, you know, and, and, I, and, and in that sense, I feel like, you know, New York's not going anywhere. You know, I feel like the, the nature of it is that it's undergoing these different permutations and it might, you know, pander to, to different sensibilities, you know, but it's always going to pander to somebody. You yeah. Know? I think the thing that inspires me or that, that sort of keeps me from getting bummed out about uh, about sort of the you know gentrification is as you as you were saying is like there's always an option to sort of like strip back aesthetic and i think aesthetic is the thing that like you were saying the condominium companies and the brands in general are, are can so easily co-opt but i think um i think things like c- composition and soul um and drawing from actual real life experience in music is something that cannot be co-opted and i think as a songwriter it's you know i think more so than being a producer like i think when you're a producer your sound can be nabbed and copied so quickly and i i'm i'm and I, even as a vocalist but um but I think as a writer, that's the thing I feel the most confident in being a New Yorker that that one can own. Yeah. And, and th- I mean, that's so true, you know, and, and not that not that companies are, you know, or, or just this general idea of like, you know, branding behind uh, the generation of what should be such an elemental and personal mm-hmm. thing, you know, not that they don't try to emulate, you know, but it's always funny when I hear a, uh, you know, a, I don't know, like a a Chili's commercial or something that like yeah. that song basically sounds like LCD sound system or something but you as a musician you know that they can't co-opt you know what is the true sentiment behind the song even though someone would want to contort it to mean yeah. something else or or to soundtrack like a you know what is ultimately an artificial experience or a commodity of some kind yeah um, but I mean that's also just I, I feel like you know music is kind of flirting a little bit more with that just because of the nature of you know I mean it's, it's like the record industry you know unless you're Prince and then you got control of your catalog um, uh, which apparently I'd read today that uh, he didn't have a will, so there's actually going to be quite a bit of, uh, or it could potentially get, you know, very complicated wow. in the litigative aspects of it. Um, so who owns his catalog now? I don't know. That's like, wow. yeah, if this was like our, you know, uh, this morning edition NPR show. This would be like the, the topic. <laughs> uh, but uh, I feel like, uh, I mean, you know, ultimately he's always had that, uh, kind of uh, a very to me very smart protective attitude about you know keeping his music and, and being the proprietor of it you know and and ultimately like I think that was part of you know his, ex- his eccentricities but I think we all wish that we could be in a position where we have the liberty to do that you know um, yeah it's true I think it gets harder and harder for every younger generation to be able to control your work in that way like for example halfway through our last our last tour, we started putting up no filming, no photography signs up in our shows just because it was getting so distracting. Like people using flash photography within the crowd, I think just totally takes away from not just other people's experience, but it actually distracts me on stage. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think like, oh, I should be more professional. I should learn how to not think about it, not notice it, but we're, n- we're not actors, we're musicians. Totally. And I think at a certain point you have to decide where you want to focus and, um, and that's not where I want to focus. So we started putting up signs and it, it changed things a little bit, but not a lot. And I, yeah. and I think at this point, there's this idea built into pop culture. And I think especially with younger audiences that, um, that you go to the shows to, 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 take, document it. to take documentation and that you're helping the artist by doing that. And I think this is not a new conversation, but um, I don't believe that it always helps. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that it, it you know helps at all, but um, but it's funny because I feel like you know in 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 1990, if you had a bad show, you know maybe only uh, you know Madison, Wisconsin would be aware of it, you know. Uh, but if yeah. 
but now it's ultimately like that could be a document that lives on and, and ultimately I mean I guess there's something useful about that feedback but I always think of uh, there's a really amazing uh, video on YouTube of like Van Halen performing Jump and the guy didn't realize that his keyboard was like transposed like half a step up or something so he just starts playing the chords and then the rest of the band <laughs> comes in <laughs> it's just like this like really you know just messed up atonal yeah um but uh, mm-hmm. but yeah. So obviously, you know, for those kind of shows, uh, you definitely wouldn't want someone like holding an iPad in front of their face, like document it, documenting it. Which is to me the weirdest display of like <laughs> the document is when someone is holding <laughs> yeah. a plate over their face. It's like Max Headroom style, you know. And they sing to it. That's the weirdest thing is when someone's <laughs> pointing a camera at you and they're singing to the camera. Totally, totally. It's sort of like who's watching who. Sometimes I think the people, the people in the audience, are putting on a way crazier show than. What's actually happening? It makes on me stage. think of that movie, Her. You know, maybe the maybe maybe whoever's crooning to the cameras in a relationship with the you know with their smartphone. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about relationships of technology and vocals for a second. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, totally. Because you are primarily an electronic musician, but voice is in all of your almost all of your music. Yeah. Um, is that is that something that started incidentally for you? Like, is it was it like, oh, well, I want this to be a song, and so my vo- voice is the one in the studio, so let's use it? Or did you have a relationship with singing? Um, has has become, being a producer helped you f- find one? Tell me about that a bit. Well, um, my dad definitely uh, taught me to sing a little bit. Um, you know, uh, just by the virtue of like forcing me to learn Frank Sinatra songs for Christmas and stuff like wow. that. Yeah, I mean, and back then, like, before I was really listening to music actively, you know, in the sense that, like, I wanted to make music and and eventually found the bands and artists that, you know, that I still listen to now. Um, I mean, I was pretty much just just listening to, like, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, or all this, like, old music, you know. Uh, And and I just had not been exposed to, yeah, obviously everyone has that, like, you know, gateway band, like a a Radiohead or something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, but up until then, and you know, and I'll defend, you know, old blue eyes even now. I'll say like, yeah, like those records are amazing. Like, but, uh, but I remember then that those are the songs I was learning to sing and I didn't really stick with it. Yeah. I, to some extent, I can't help but think like how my voice would have evolved or changed as a singer or even just, you know, my cadence as a person speaking, if that had been my focus, you know, it's like that vocal range and those, you know, just singing old standards. And it's funny because like that's kind of my go-to karaoke stuff now because it's the only use it really has in my life. Um, but uh, but I had to, I mean, with my first band, Ghost Hustler, it was kind of a thing where like, well, I wanted to make music and, you know, I was listening to predominantly a lot of electronic music with vocals. You know, I definitely had a complete New Order obsession then yeah, and still do, you know, but ultimately that stuff was guided, you know, by verses and choruses and, and, and by the virtue of that, I've gotten really bad at learning how to, like lately I've just been working on, you know, whether it be more ambient stuff uh, for film or just wanting to make dance music, you know, just for fun and realizing that like, I don't have an ear for sequencing unless there's vocals on it because it's helping you guide the song. Wow. Um, Cause one thing, you know, I feel like one thing kind of informs the other, um, but you know, just like, getting better as a vocalist just came with like time you know and I remember a long time ago I'd, uh, I'd asked you if you knew of any uh, uh, any vocal trainers um, which I wound up just you know being so in the mess of the record that I just kind of wung it um, but it's funny because like there's things I, I now know you know it's when you start learning what keys are ideal for you or you know what styles kind of complement your vocals you know your your I guess your voice or whatever the composition is because there's things I can't do like you know there's certain like I'll catch myself if I'm trying to sing like very low I just kind of sound like uh, um, like uh, the scene in Home Alone where you know Culkin's <laughs> talking to the talk boy and just pitches it down and he's like credit card no problem you know or something like where you feel like it's an affectation it's like not like you you know yeah and that's funny but you're you're like a trained vocalist uh, kind of, yeah. When I was uh, when I was young, when I was, uh, I guess starting in third grade, I started singing in choir, and I sang in choir all the way up through high school. So I guess that would be until seventeen. Um, that's where I got them. I spent the majority of hours singing, but I, not just in in school choir. I was in a bunch of school choirs, but I sang in two church choirs and wow. had an acapella group, and I was in two new metal bands in high school. So, no way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that that was. That was the bulk of my, my my training, if you will. But uh, when I was 
uh, 15 and 16, I took opera lessons once a week in a sort of casual way, the way a teenager tries a lot of different things and um, didn't pursue it. But actually went back to that same teacher uh, two years ago now and said, um, I'm working on a chairlift record and I'm doing some stuff that's using my voice in a really different way and I'm afraid that if I take it on the road, I'm going to damage my voice permanently. Yeah. So I asked, um, I asked her if she would consider, you know, jumping back in with me so I could learn how to use my voice in a safe way. So we actually started by, and mostly work on classical repertoires, like like a lot of Rachmaninoff and Handel and place, you know, and some Mozarts and Bach, but, but learning how to get as much volume out of my body safely. Uh, and opera is the most amazing medium for that because you really have to use your entire torso as a as a, a uh, acoustic reson- resonating chamber. It's not coming from your throat. It's coming your your whole body is the instrument, um, which is really interesting. And actually, going back and listening to the the recordings that are on the chairlift record, I could do them a lot better now after having spent, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, that's so, the irony. Which is good sure. because the 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 eventual goal was to learn how to tour safely, and 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 thankfully I got that out of it. You got to tour safe, kids. To us, safe. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I always feel like uh, I'm most ready to work on a record right when I've just finished a record yep. because you know you you're a, a well-oiled music machine at that point. You know, like yep. I feel like so much of to me at least making a record uh, and this one was was the most collaborative. You know, in terms of bringing people in and, and almost kind of treating it like a movie. Production Tell me about or that. Who did you bring in this this time around? Uh, well, my brother wound up being, you know, the, the thread that just unraveled the whole thing um, because I, you know, I, I had lost uh, the record that I was working on um, and, uh, and you know, literally I just had my laptop swiped, um, but uh, which is actually, I mean, it's totally my own fault because it was like we had played Terminal 5 and like it was, it was just a belligerent, debaucherous night where I was just like kind of, you know, obfuscating just blindly into the abyss and then I got back to my apartment and I realized I didn't have my keys. Um, my roommates weren't answering the phone. I tried to go to my old apartment, wake up my old roommates. And then while I was kind of figuring out what to do, kind of in this drunken stupor, I was just like sitting on my stoop. Um, and, uh, and I just nodded off. And like when I woke up, my laptop was totally gone. So, you know, it was lesson learned, um, you know. But I would say uh, after that, you know, I kind of... Uh, stepped away from music for a little bit and was kind of thinking about, all right, well, you know, DJing something that you haven't done in a long time. And when I was in a habit of doing that every week in college uh, with my drummer, Jason, you know, we were voraciously hunting for records, which yeah. there, you know, in turn provides you with this new subset of influences, mm-hmm. you know? And I feel like that was something that I hadn't done since before the first record and the last two had just kind of been made with that with those same ideas in mind so i just thought i like all right let's go back to the blueprint and listen to some new stuff and get back into that habit of just like collecting music and little by little i started kind of getting these ideas you know and uh and ultimately you know you know this record in particular all the records have been this way but this one in particular was just kind of this chimera of things i love you know and old, and whatever it is that is intrinsically me about the album is not for me to decide because when yeah. i'm working on it it's just kind of you know the 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 line between appropriating something and then and it coming from a very personal place just gets blurred really fast but uh my brother I had him come in and play bass, and I knew he's always been funky. You know, he's always kind of, <laughs> he's always had that sensibility. Um, but what I didn't realize is that you know he had been developing these like insane chops in all these different genres because you know in San Antonio working as like a session player, you can't totally pick all your projects. So you know yep. you have to be flexible. And he was playing in Tejano bands and was playing in uh, you know like bluegrass and metal and gospel and all this stuff. But the gospel repertoire wound up being super useful because. That was all like Earth, Wind, and Fire, and you know, just like all this like classic disco and soul. And he picked up guitar just to get better at it. Like that's the kind of guy he is. Mm-hmm. So he just started learning these like insane like octave guitar riffs. And that's when I realized like, whoa, like we, you know, we have now found this perfect point where we can start collaborating. Which you know, our parents were always just like, when are you gonna collaborate with your brother? You know. <laughs> Um, but I'm glad that it happened organically because you know he's he, he played on you know good like six songs on the record. But if the first record was just me and the second record was like three people between like me and the mastering engineer, this record was like 17 people um, start to finish, and it wasn't intentionally 
you know, gluttonous, but it was just like, I just worked on it so slowly for so long that sometimes a studio would be open with the session player in mind, but then that place has its own engineers. And then, you know, once I was uh, kind of at the finishing line mixing with, uh, with Alex, Alex Epton, uh, you know, he knew a couple of people that, you know, we could bring in for, uh, you know, for um, backup vocals or, you know, my friend Nick from Holy Ghost played uh, drums Nick on Slumlord. such a killer drummer. Oh, he's amazing. He's great. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of evolved from there. I know Morgan um, from Midnight Magic uh, played a lot of uh, keys. Uh, my friend uh, Mark, whom I met through Ben Allen in Atlanta, uh, did percussion on a lot of songs. So it was just kind of just, you know, uh, we would always it would always come back to you know like oh we need cowbell I know a guy it would it always come back to I know a guy you know hey that's why people move to New York right totally totally because the guy probably lives like around the block exactly exactly yeah this this most recent trailer record was definitely the most collaborative that we've ever done but I think that was sort of because of two different factors one was that we we self produced it and had a had our own studio where um, where we were doing things and I think you know in the past when we've been working with you know pro producers who are you know contractually making a record there's this sense that you're on the clock that you know you've got the studio time you're paying for the studio time you're paying for this guy to be there and so you don't want to risk wasting time by having people yeah. come in and and just either either sit in or have dinner with you or just listen or or just you know drop in um, but this was the opposite you know f- we had so many friends that would actually just show up unannounced to just to come hang and listen or like you know they picked up a sandwich and wanted to come eat it at our studio so we had people moving in and out and that did that did a couple things um, the first was that we had you know amazing musicians that without really giving it much thought we said hey get on this track get on this track get on this track but also we had a built in audience and in the past our our you know, our, our vibe in the studio had been quite insular, had been really private and had felt like a sort of lab. And this time around, it actually felt like something more like a party or like a home. And I think having that constant sort of feedback um, made us sort of more responsive and, and you know, left, left more things up to sort of intuition and chemistry and saying, oh, this is working, this is working. And, and also, you know, we had this sort of impulse to entertain, like, you know, we want to make people say, whoa, and... Um, and it was it was nice to have more more years in the room, but I think as I as I get older as a musician, that's something that I'm more and more comfortable with. Like I think when you're young, especially as a vocalist, you have this sense of not wanting anyone to hear what you're doing as you're doing it. Yeah. Um, but then as you get older and more confident, which is to say, you actually care less about what people think. Not necessarily yeah. that you're a better better musician, but that you actually just care less because you've done more and you, you know it doesn't matter if people think you're not sure. good. You kind of <clears throat> lose that chip on your shoulder a little bit. Exactly. Then uh, it starts getting more interesting to have people present as you're recording or as you're writing, um, and that's something that that I'm really interested in at this point is sort of that performative aspect of recording. Well, I also wanted to ask about um, some of the influences behind the record mm. because I hear you know obviously, and I know we're both fans of Bill Nelson. I was going to say you used the word chimera earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but also, I mean, I definitely, and maybe I'm just projecting because, you know, I've, I've, I've been very into a lot of Balearic stuff in the past couple of years, yeah. but I was hearing little notes of like things that, you know, would be getting played at Club Amnesia or something where you've got like Linda DeFranco or some Sade records, you know, or stuff that, you know, ultimately like certain type of, uh, chorus guitar tones or certain type of percussion, uh, components. Um, yeah. Like what were you listening to? Um, you know, I'm kind of a... My music listening, I'm not one of those sort of encyclopedic academic people who sort of dabbled in everything. My, my knowledge of music is actually limited to a couple pockets. Um, and so I, I don't, I'm sort of embarrassed to say I don't even really know anything in the, in the Balearic camp. Um, I, did, I did recognize the name of Sade in there, totally, but nothing totally. else that you mentioned. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I go on tangents. Don't, don't mind me. No, it's fine. I think, um, <laughs> well, what I was listening to is, was pretty different than what Patrick was listening to, and I think that's one of the nice things about Chairlift is that Patrick and I are, always have our heads in different places aesthetically, so the result ends up being something sort of unfamiliar. Um, but when we, were, when we were starting out this record, um, I was actually listening to... Um, Let's see, this would have been like 2015. Late. I was listening to a lot of pop, um, like a lot of mainstream pop, like a uh, and an R&B. Like I really, really like that that rapper Dej Loaf. Mm. Um, I love her voice. I love her flow. So I was listening to a lot of Dej uh, at the beginning. 
Um, I was listening to... Um, I got really into this sort of one pocket of Japanese pop that was made in the late 80s that was called City Pop at the time. Okay. Um, and weirdly, it was, it was being made in Tokyo at the time that I lived there, but of course I didn't know about it because I was a very young child. But it's sort of interesting how these things sort of come back around. Um, but City Pop is essentially built on on fusion jazz combined with, or jazz fusion combined with um, sort of like MOR adult sophista pop. Oh yeah, totally. Um song you know song writing kind of style kind of like blue nile sort of vibes yeah but even a sort of more sheenier and commercial than blue nile but combined with serious jazz musicianship um so tatsuri yamashita is sort of the phil collins of japan and he's still huge he still plays stadiums but um but americans aren't really familiar with his work but he had a at a phase in the late 80s where he was just playing with the most incredible musicians and all these recordings were sort of were, were very very funky but unlike sort of more western funk there is a sort of surgical precision to it and an extremely beautifully balanced mixes and I and f- by listening to that stuff I thought you know I really I'm really interested in in this idea of hi-fi because in the past you know when Cherryleaf was was making these recordings we were actually trying to make things sound abstract and and dirty and layered mm-hmm. um, as opposed to as opposed to really really clean and and three-dimensional and, and spatial we were trying to do the opposite and break break sounds down and mush them together um and patrick you know ha- has been you know sort of producing around town since you know since he moved here and he was sort of ready to to sort of show off and and expand his chops as an engineer and also as a producer so we we sort of got into this record with that idea of we wanted to make a really hi-fi record but we wanted the soul of it to feel contemporary like to get at what it feels like to be in new york in 2015 and 2016 um to get at that that sort of energy of of walking down the street you know that, that only new york can give you um and what, i i love that that uh aspect of the record I love that every sound is you know I mean it it showcases uh, not not just like the bravado of you know the playing but also like I love that I can hear every individual texture you know it gives you a lot to because um, I tend to just sort of you know it's like you chuck a burrito at the window and it just kind of goes like you know um, but I uh, yeah it, it really it, it lets you you know kind of ruminate on every sound it's really cool sometimes when i listen back to it it sounds like too much like oh gosh how can people even how can people even enjoy this there's too much going on but i think with every record we try to scale back more and more and whether that's a successful effort i'm not sure but um but we we're we're trying we're trying we're we're both maximalists and we're both obsessed with textures and sounds so patrick and i really have to work actually to, to limit how much we're putting in it's funny because uh, do you ever get to the point where, and this happens to me all the time, where if I've been sitting on a song for too long and I come back to it, I don't realize that that initial idea was probably enough to carry it. So I just start throwing more stuff on top and more mm. stuff on top. And then by the end, you know, you kind of almost have to, uh, well, I, by the end, that's typically when you're hoping for someone else's second opinion to be like, you know, not not so much producing, but reducing, you know, where they just yep. start taking things out. Yep. Um, and I've tried to get better at that, but, you know, I mean, the irony is that this, you know, probably the most bells, bells and whistles that I put on a record has been this last one, you know? Yeah, I think when you're working alone, it's hard to, it's hard to kill your children, so to speak, when you've put so much love into every layer of a, of a composition. There were three songs that we felt uh, on this record that we felt were overstuffed, but we couldn't bear to part with any part of them. So we actually brought in this young producer in L.A. named Robin Hannibal to, we gave him, you know, essentially completed... It's a great name, by the way. Oh, he's the best. Uh, he's Danish. Um, and he is a master of you know both hi-fi and funk, but also like very minimal production. So uh, so we thought he'd be a really good match. So we did a did a sort of brief set of sessions with him in LA, where we brought him songs that you know both we and the label thought could be ready to master, but said you know what can you gut from these? How can how can you tighten these up? And he did an amazing job, just saying wow. let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. And very often he'd do something, and we'd go no, and then we'd sleep on it, and wake up the morning next morning, and go yeah. Yes. Um, and we cut complete. we cut yeah. minutes off songs. To Ching was a minute and a half longer than it was after we got out of the session with him, and he was great, just slashing and burning, but with a very tasteful and musical approach. So, um, and he 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 added added a couple um, a couple elements here and there too, which um, which was amazing. Definitely stuff we would not have thought to add ourselves. So it was it was very fruitful. I would con- I would consider working with him again or any any producer again in that exact way, sort of as a no, like as a, uh, a butcher. 
Yeah. I, I've always been obsessed with the idea of um, freeing something up to be greater than the sum of your contributions yep. to it, you know? And, and I feel like that's, did that come with time where you, you get to this place where you're you're less, uh, and, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, as far as like working on music privately versus now, you know, allowing it to be a little bit more open forum and bringing people in. Is Did that grow over time? And, you know, this, this attitude of like, I just want to make the best record I can. It's not about, you know, me making the best record it's just about the thing existing on its own as this like fantastic thing you know yeah i mean honestly my my opinion about records as as a form in general has been wildly oscillating for the last year like if you asked me a year ago if i wanted to make a a record i would have said no i just want to make singles i want to make a couple short eps um that that was my initial feeling after finishing moth but now having you know spent some time touring i realize how much context an album can give a song and i think um i think some artists are masters of context like lana, lana del rey for example you know she can do something that's so simple but because of the world of context that she's built up around her a record it can seem so uh so psychopathic yeah. you know some, a gesture that would be simple or sweet for anyone else to do and i think a record is really the best way to do that because you have enough material that the songs can inform each other and the art can inform everything and you've had enough time to really steep in it that the symbols start coming out and you can start applying them in sophisticated ways whereas I think, you know, a single song like I also think about Formation by Beyonce is, is so loaded that a song has enough context to, you know, wrap up the rest of it a whole album with a bow I, again, it depends on the song but I think the more subtle that you want to make a song the more it benefits from being on an album Yeah that's wild. And it, well, speaking of albums too, when you were mentioning, um, uh, uh, was it City Pop? Yeah. The, a long time ago, I came across this record that I didn't get, but it was just called City Music Volume One, and it looks like almost like an old like '80s like Sony Discman um, mm -hmm. as the cover, and it was a compilation of uh, of like Japanese, you know, presumably Tokyo based like pop acts of that time but now i'm now wondering like is that what that record sounds like or oh. that, i mean i'm assuming it must be that if it was just called yeah i mean like yeah i mean he tatsuri yamashita was by no means the only artist or even sort of central um or any of the uh, the ymo characters uh kind of affiliated with that or um kind of like i think hosono was was working with some uh Artist. There's one in particular I love named Asami Kato, mm -hmm. who is incorporating some sort of dub, more dub elements into wow. the into the backbone of her work, and and you can kind of get a get a sort of funkier, harsher edge, like a sort of Hosuno feeling. I'm not sure if he actually produced that record or not. Um, but my personal favorite, and I think the artist that inspired me the most um, from that era, is a is a lady who's actually still performing. Um, her name is Mishi Ogawa, mm -hmm. and she uh, was in a couple groups before going solo. One was called Wahaha, which was making much more experimental, progressive punk music than would even be classifiable under city pop. Um, harsher jazz noise. And then, and she was a vocalist for that. And then a group called Chakra that was bringing in more sort of traditional Japanese um, and also funk elements into that mix. And again, I think that wasn't sleek enough to call it city pop. But then she made a beautiful record um, called called... Oh, I forget if it's three to four or four to three. It's four to three, um, called four to three, and like the aspect ratio. I guess uh, I guess so, right? That would be a vertical image. Yeah. Um, or that be with. I've had too much coffee. I can't even think straight. But um, but the way she sings and and also composes for um, for drums and for guitar is in these sort of like waves these sort of irregular gestalts like things will bloom and blossom in these really organic ways um and the recordings stay clean they stay even and it's extremely emotional um so much good musicianship so that record sort of became like a blueprint for me of what i wanted to do not necessarily with chairlift but just in general with everything yeah. um for for a while and i still listen to it all the time but but man i haven't been as obsessed with the record probably since i was like you know 16 as i as i was with that record for it's the last when two those years rare birds come in it, yeah when just perfect albums um and then towards the end of making moth i started listening to a, com uh, a contemporary indian composer named a.r raman who's you know he's like the bigger than kanye over there he's he's a, a film composer and he's been the number one film composer there since 
Yeah, since the since the late '80s. Oh wow! Is that that? Um, I've seen a video of a. <clears throat> it was probably like the largest concert. Uh, just because I think there, there's like um, the, you know, one time I was like thumbing through this like Wikipedia article of like la- largest concerts on record, and obviously there's like Jean Michel Jarre, but there was an Indi- uh, there was an Indian composer that I believe that was him, but it was just like, you know, just so many people at the show, definitely in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, I don't I don't know, but it, it feasibly could be him. How long has he been uh, writing? I mean, I want to say since the '80s, but. But it could be longer than that. That's just the, at the point where I started. That's the point in his career where I started picking up on his work. But um, I became particularly interested in a in a pocket of his work in the early '90s because that's when they started getting um, all the same synths and samplers and drum machines that we were using for techno music. Yeah. But but he was using it for for soundtracks, and and this was before they started auto tuning and pitch correcting the vocals before they started incorporating you know really obvious western influences into the sort of chromatic aspect of the songwriting and so you really ended up you know you had these things that were rooted in indian classical music and indian religious music but with this really really rich and fat palette that it had, had tabla and it had four on the floor like techno techno kick amazing yeah. um and it's amazing the stuff that came out you know it's, it's almost easy to hear Bjork in some of this stuff and she was for sure listening to that um, but but uh, there's one vocalist in particular K.S. Chitra who just has the most incredible voice she's a big 50 year old lady but she was doing the voices for all these like hot young ingenue mm-hmm. actresses um, because they do you know the voiceovers and all the Bollywood films there totally and, and uh, I, I don't know I, I the whole I was just in love with the whole thing so I think um it was almost like finding a, a piece of the puzzle that was missing very late in the process. But. Do you have a favorite uh, Bollywood movie? Oh, yes, and I don't know how to pronounce it. Let me see if I can hack my way through how it's called. It's uh, I turn up our oh, yeah, we should mention our soundtrack. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, got of a bit of a. Um, an homage to, uh, let's say, Lori Spiegel. Got some uh, ambient, self-generated electronic music happening in the background. Brought a couple of uh, instruments. Should I just be like making some sounds while you're well, looking that up? Technically, you have an art. I got it. I'm just going to do my best to pronounce it. Kandu konden, kandu konden. Oh, gotcha. Um, it's funny. My favorite. I remember when I was living in Denton, uh, my friends showed me this film called Lagan that is like just almost like a four hour Bollywood epic about this cricket match and everything about it is like one of the most spectacular movies I've ever seen it's really great um, have you ever been to India? I haven't I haven't I would love to go that's one of those places where you know, we got to go to um, Asia on tour uh, this last year and it's, we're just kind of slowly just checking off you know just like alright <laughs> parts of the world that I really want to go to but yeah India is definitely next on the list did you get to go to Seoul? No, we actually, we had a show there and the, um, uh, for whatever reason, like the festival funds fell through. Um, so we didn't wind up, you know, like getting to play, but we did, you know, we went to a whole plethora of places. We went to, um, Jakarta, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Beijing, Taipei, Bangkok, um, and then went down to Tokyo, Osaka, um, but, you know, for me, it was just, like, also an amazing food tour. Because the older you get on tour, the, it, it's less about partying and more... About food. <laughs> more about food, for sure, uh-huh. definitely. Um, which I would say, bar none, uh, Indonesian cuisine was, was to, to me, the, the, the most uh, exotic in terms of, like, anything I've ever had before. Because I remember right when we got there, the first meal was, like, uh, like dried, almost, like, kind of... Not quite jerky, but, like, very, you know, like, it would break, uh, um, like, dried beef lung... Uh, and we then long. I remember the dinner before the show. Uh, it's funny. It was like 100% humidity. It was like outdoors. Does that and, mean you can swim? Uh, <laughs> one would think uh, because I was definitely practically swimming in my sweat. Uh, but yeah, it was just like super hot. You know, it was like in, in the high 90s. And just before uh, we went to go have this dinner, it's like kind of like a traditional style where they bring out all these plates and, you know, they're just bringing you food. You're not really ordering anything in particular. And then later they count up the... Um, the plates and you know that's how they sort of calculate the tab but um i remember i had um cow brains in a in a curry 
uh, which I guess like I, I'm definitely not a picky eater and I'm sure that once you know like once we're in our weird dystopian future where we're all eating crickets like I'll be stoked because crickets are dope mm-hmm. uh, but I feel like um, it is delicious as, as it all was it was totally the wrong thing to eat like an hour Ooh. before a show because I'm just like you know I've had this like banquet meal and I'm just up there on stage just like trying to do you know my little mm-hmm. my little pirouettes uh, and like the humidity, I, I felt like, you know, like meatloaf. Uh, like you the know. cow is thinking for you now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, for sure. We, we became one. That's for sure. Um, wow. but, um, but, you know, incredible meal nonetheless. Oh, that sounds so good. That's funny that you mentioned touring in Asia because last night I started thinking that I, um, I wanted to do a, a translated version of one of our songs. I, there's something I've done on every record, like t- taking one song and translate into another language, but... I wanted to try either Korean or Chinese. I don't speak either one of them, but I was thinking, you know, it would be nice if doing something like that could pave the way for us to go there. Well, you had a, a, a single in Japanese, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. Which I remember seeing at a Japanese record store, and I was super pumped. Yeah, we did a really cool uh, version of that song for um, for a Japanese label. I, I don't speak Japanese, but I grew up listening to it because my parents speak it. They spoke it at home a little bit, and I went to preschool in Japanese. Um, and I, you know, heard it on TV and around as a as a kid. So I think it comes much more naturally in terms of like sounds and cadence than Chinese would. Chin, you know, especially you know, Mandarin or Cantonese. It, it has such a different set of the sonics are so subtle. So I, totally. Um, so that would be fun. That'd be really fun to do. Yeah, I've definitely been uh, wanting to write music in Spanish for a long time. Um, but it's funny because I feel like when I speak Spanish and it's perfectly yeah, functional, right. you know, you're, like you're totally fluent, right? Totally, totally. And that was my first language. But because I haven't had as much like practice, um, you know, in the past few years, like, you know, I'll talk to my parents on the phone in Spanish. Or, but my brother, my brother and I, we just speak in English to each other, just kind of out of force of habit because we would be communicating at school. And it would be weird for us to start just suddenly speaking in Spanish and mm, like excluding our yeah. friends. But um, but I remember. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like I. Whenever I go to Mexico and I do press, you know, like I can definitely speak in Spanish, but I, there's a certain aspect of my personality that isn't represented just because so much of Spanish is like super colloquial and very like slang oriented. You know, it could be a conversation amongst doctors and they're, you know, just be like, este pinche cabrón, which by the way, cursing in Spanish can, I don't know if <laughs> we can get away yeah. with that. Well, um, but don't you feel like because um, lyrics have this automatic sort of detachment from speech? It wouldn't matter. Like, even if your Spanish was more formal, that would work with the format of electronic music. Well, I mean, I think to some extent, I also, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm no Pablo Neruda. You know, I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> gotta work on my lyrics a little bit. Yeah. I think that's the one thing where it's like, it's I haven't really found a, you know, a, a poeticism mm. um, when I speak Spanish that I'm like still kind of trying to tap into, just out of the virtue of never having tried to write music in Spanish. Yeah. Um, but it's in there all the time. You know, there's certain songs in this last record that. That I started, you know, that there was kind of this like toss up in terms of like if they could be sang in English or Spanish, you know, with things that were definitely already flirting with what, you know, to my brother and I were kind of these like, um, you know, almost like cumbia rhythms like 16 Sigma mm-hmm. Avenue or mm-hmm. Annie. Totally. Um, so in that sense, I, you know, it's long overdue. But I also, you know, in that sense, I don't want to pander because I feel like um, if I do it, I want it to be a sincere gesture that, you know, it's just kind of is birth of this. Of, of this genuine desire to want to write something in a, in a language that I haven't really had a lot of experience writing in, you know, because I feel like if I, uh, you know, if I if I did it in some way that felt disingenuine, you know, and, and, and to me it's like, as someone who is from Mexico, I wouldn't want, you know, to, to feel like, like I, I was doing it as like a wink and a nod, you know, I would want it to be its own sort of standalone statement. Hmm. Um, which in a way is, you know, you, you kind of wonder... Uh, if you're operating in an English-speaking market, if you know, if you would be alienating um, your Eng- you know English-speaking fans by writing a song in Spanish, that that you then you know have no aspirations of translating for them, you know. I guess for you know going back to what we were talking about earlier, the the influences for the chairlift record, I was very, I felt very. Um, I guess I feel like listening to music in a language I don't understand sensitizes me to the music more. Mm-hmm. It makes you read into the emotion of the vocal as opposed to the uh, to the lyrics, which actually I found to be more sometimes a more liberating musical listening experience. Totally. Um, because the, sometimes the things that you imagine they're saying are much purer than what they may actually be saying. It feels almost more universally human 
mm-hmm. um, and less specific and less tied to any you know particular narrative. It's it's easier to make it your own in a way, and yeah. so that made me sort of approach my own relationship with English in a very different way. Like a lot of the songs that we wrote were actually just started with what I call an applesauce, which I would just sing syllables. And actually sometimes the production would be almost completed before I'd actually switch from an applesauce vocal to a lyric, a final lyric. I love that term, by the way. And and some songs, you know, I I really pounded them into the ground to make the lyrics make sense and deliver a, a and I had a very specific idea, but others I didn't, and I left the applesauce almost intact, really just changing the sounds to words. Like, for example, the last song on our record is called No Such Thing as Illusion, and those lyrics are very ha- hard to decipher if you're just listening to the track, but if you read along, they're quite clear. Um, and weirdly, I, I, I think they're some of the most sincere lyrics on the album, and I, and I think when you, you know, you were saying you're no Pablo Neruda, but I think sometimes when you turn your sort of intentional lyric brain off, really beautiful things can happen. But I guess this is a sort of roundabout way of, of me encouraging you to write in, write in Spanish and A, not worry about people judging you, you know, judging your relationship with your roots or accusing you of pandering. But I think because really beautiful things can happen that would not happen otherwise or p- would potentially not happen otherwise. Very true. Have you ever uh, uh, played shows in Mexico? We have. Um... We we played we played down there twice. We actually played there in November, and it was incredible. We went down for a, fo- for a festival called Corona Capital. Oh yeah, Corona totally. Capital. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great pronunciation. Gracias. <laughs> and it was. I mean, I thought it would be you know cool. I thought it'd be sort of an average festival experience. Fans are so emotional there. I couldn't believe it. Totally. We were we were playing them a record that hadn't come out yet. You know, we only played two songs that anyone there would know, and people were dancing so hard, freaking out, so excited to be hearing new material. Much more, I think, appreciative than American audiences were generally. Also, it was a free festival, which was amazing because you end up with whole families that were going together, and you know, multi generational fan groups, which was amazing and we did a meet and greet afterwards and you know I I cried multiple times with people who were also crying I did not I did not go down there expecting that and you know ever since then I post Instagram pictures and people say come back to Mexico come back to Mexico so really supportive sweet audience there the only time that someone has licked the van window as we were driving away oh, was in Mexico wow. City so that <laughs> that says anything well I think I think that's a really had a, a proper window licker for sure <laughs> I think that's sort of a high point of our conversation yeah for sure for sure definitely um, well it's been lovely chatting with you Alan likewise absolutely Mercy.